Hello, hello, everybody. This is your host, Akil Jabbar, and welcome back to another episode of SaaS District. On today's episode, we'll be talking about what are some advantages of bootstrapping your startup and still being able to get acquired. Today, we have our guest, Einar Volset, with us. Einar is uh, currently the founder and general partner at Tiny Seed, a remote-based startup accelerator designed for early-stage bootstrap SaaS founders, which provides funding, community, guidance, advice, and mentorship. He is also the managing partner of Discretion Capital, a technology-enabled investment bank focused on M&A, due diligence, and strategic partnerships development for tech and technology-enabled service businesses. Einar was previously a professor of computer science at Cornell University. He is a serial entrepreneur who founded many companies like Remail, which was acquired by Google in 2010, Octopus Mercantile, and Apt Aftercare, a company which was built from scratch with zero outside funding, uh, which was completely bootstrapped from zero until it was uh, acquired in 2016. Einar was also CEO at Left Coast R&D and is an advisor at Trigger.io and Biome.me. Um, so huge accomplishments and impressive achievements so far. Uh, welcome, Einar, and uh, thank you again for taking the time today and joining me for being on the show. Do you have anything else to add to that? Or? No, that's fine. Thanks for having me. Um... Yeah, I'm I'm the co-founder of Tiny Seed. My partner will be pissed off if I if you call me the founder. <laughs> I'm <laughs> doing right, it Rob. with my partner with my partner Rob Wall. Okay, cool. That's uh, Rob, right from from Drip. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, cool. Um, you know, starting from the beginning, can you share about? It seems you know you've a lot of accomplishments as an entrepreneur. When was the moment that you kind of decided that I wanted to become an entrepreneur? If you remember that time. Um, I think it was when I was doing my PhD. Actually, it was it was um. When Paul Graham, actually PG, started uh, writing his essays, you know, I guess back in the early 2000s, it must have been. And just like he was one of the first people who wrote like, this is doable, you know, like this is something you can do. Like you just start the thing and you build something people want and then you charge for it. And that's how you make money, <laughs> which I don't know, like you go through... Um, you know, classic education and things. And there's always, there's like a, there's like a pipeline, right? It's like you go through school, you do go to school, and then you get to another school and you do good at that school. And then you, you know, you get into a good university, you get good grades, and then you get a job somewhere. And, and that's sort of it. Yeah. Um, and it was really like when I was doing my PhD that, um, you know, his writing had, had a, a pretty profound Im impression on me in terms of thinking about what I wanted to do with my life. I guess, I mean, it's sort of his fault that I've never really had a real job, I guess. Okay, so direct, direct from school to, to success, that's awesome. Well, I don't know about direct <laughs> to success, but it's certainly like I haven't had a real job to my mother's chagrin, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah every founder's dream. So, um, I mean, every startup founder, I mean, they're excited about the idea of getting, you know, acquired by a big name brand. Um, I know you've had a couple of great exits with the companies you started do you, so, you know, from, you know, PhD to, you know, starting some companies, do you remember what it was like for you, those moments of like the day of like the transaction or, you know, after the, 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 the acquisitions or any of them? Well, I think, I think the, the, the sort of strangest thing that I wasn't expecting is that, you know, once it was done, you know, certainly I remember this from my last one. It's like, it doesn't take very long before you got to do something else. Mm. <laughs> it's like. You know, I think a lot of people have this view that's like, oh, if I made, you know, this kind of money, then I would just do, you know, go to the beach or golf a lot. And it's just, that's just certainly not in my DNA. Um, it certainly gives you freedoms in ways that, that perhaps um, you, you don't get in other, in other sources. Uh, but, um, but yeah, that desire to get back to work and do, and build something new is, is pretty, comes back pretty quickly. So you just went jump from one to the other. Do you remember how long that was before you started getting that itch and you're like, uh, I'm ready to go again? Uh, well, I think like the last one was 2016. And then I actually helped my wife set up where I live. She, she, we, we live on a small flower farm and help her set up like her farming business and, and things. So did that for a while and then sort of bummed around. And then I sort of got pulled into M&A work uh, probably within six months, actually, of that. And sort of was just like, all right, this sounds like a, a challenge you know cool uh, and what's your take right now with i guess you know with the covid 19 virus going on um what's what's your you know take and experience on the current environment of the SaaS industry and how has that affected your kind of investment strategy at, at tiny tiny seed it hasn't it hasn't actually uh, it, it affected it all that much we still we still have our strategy we you know we've just today actually announced our latest uh 12 or 13 investments for batch two mm -hmm. um 
our, our thesis remains the same. Like it's <clears throat> realistically the exit time for these companies is, you know, three to seven years out. And so hopefully by then this COVID thing will have blown over and things will mellow out a bit. So, so it doesn't actually impact us all that much. Um, in terms of like how, what I've seen people, uh, you know, SaaS businesses in particular do, it's, it seems to be a breakdown of about sort of 10 to 15, maybe 20% of companies are doing really badly. Typically these are companies tied to industries that are cratering. So, hmm. you know, travel or, um, you know, anything like anything, anything that's being shut down, uh, you know, the industry itself, obviously they're taking pretty severe hits. Um, on the flip side, there's probably another say 20% that are doing really well. Yeah. So these are things that are like, they were at the forefront of the remote work or something relating to that. Like zoom is sort of the poster child, but there are hundreds if not thousands of companies that sort of fit various niches where, uh, you know, this acceleration to work from home has really helped them. And then I would, I would say the other 60% right in the middle is probably doing, you know, they're down for sh mostly like whether that's conversion rates, you know, plummeting, uh, you know, failing to land any deals or whatever. But so there may be five, ten percent down MRR in April, maybe, uh, even though maybe perhaps they were on a growth trajectory beforehand. Right. But they haven't really seen the same kind of uh, sort of fatal or or near fatal um, outcomes to some of the worst of the companies. Have done. Makes sense. Yeah, I remember we were talking right before this uh, about the one podcast company you have in your portfolio. I would imagine they're they're in that top twenty percent at this at this stage. I would say so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> for, for the remainder of the companies, like with the situation, um, let's say the 60 or 80 percent of the of those companies, are you speaking or advising on your startups, uh, you know, how to how to plan uh, on the short term, midterm, long term basis uh, for the strategy? Or are you just kind of leaving that to them at this point? Leaving a lot of it to them, like, you know, we're we're minority investors. We're not buyout funds. We don't we don't take a board seat. We don't operate like that. I've actually spent a disproportionate amount of my time in the last three or four weeks helping uh, our U.S. companies at least uh, navigate the sort of government PPP EIDL type programs. Um, so that's been helpful, at least to a degree, uh, for a bunch of our companies. But like, you know, it's, it, <laughs> there are all these people are saying like, oh, it's never going to be the same and everything has changed. And I'm like, well, yes, kind of yes and no. You know, I think certainly there'll be a number of companies that take a hit with this. But, you know, I, I don't fundamentally see I don't fundamentally think companies should change their strategy based on this, at least not their long, medium to long term trend. Mm, so just making some some changes on the on the short term, mainly just to keep up for cash flow and whatnot. Yeah, cash is king. I mean, I like most of these companies that we're we're certainly we're investing in are quite um, uh, quite frugal companies. You know, they're not typically your or they're they're just not your typical you know, Silicon Valley venture based growth at all costs, you know, fundraise every 18 months or go off a cliff type companies. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them are sort of uniquely positioned to just sort of hunker down and, and survive through it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I keep joking, actually, that I wish we'd raised our fund too, because we were already because we would have been in a perfect position as all these startup venture backed startups blow up left and right. Right. Um, but yeah, no, that's, yeah, that's pretty much what's going on. So I know you've done, I believe you've done both, right? You've bootstrapped several companies and maybe, you know, you're pretty familiar with the, the VC funding phase. You know, with Tiny Suit, you guys are you're focused with bootstrap companies. Do you, do you ever make a recommendation specifically for any of the founders say, okay, you know, you should actually go towards more you know, raise VC capital or you should remain v, uh, bootstrapped? Um, you, certainly, like we think probably about 10 to maybe 20% of the companies that come through will realize that they have a bigger opportunity than perhaps they thought. Mm. And, and in some cases, like, you know, and, and that might be because they just didn't realize how big a market they were going after or because they pivoted in some way, shape or form towards something bigger. And at that point, it, it, it may make sense to, to go out and, and, and raise venture capital. And, and certainly we're very supportive of that. Like if that's if that's something that makes sense for the for the for the company and the team, then and the founder, then, you know, <laughs> go do that. It makes a lot of sense to do so. Um, it's rare that well, I, I don't think we would ever say like, hey, you, you should stay. If, if a founder is determined to, to go raise funding or whatever, uh, I don't think we're going to advise them to say, hey, you guys should stay bootstrapped. Um, it's sort of a founder decision more than anything else. It's just important to us. And I think in general, this is true. It's like, it's important for us that founders understand that money isn't free <laughs> in a way. And it's like, you know, if you take, I don't know, $2 million on a $10 million, uh, pre, then 
certainly those investors are, are going to expect a, a kind of outcome um, in order to get the kind of returns that they need for their portfolios. Right. And so I think a lot of people are like chasing after the biggest possible valuation and then they get snookered when they're like, oh, I have an offer for $30 million for my SaaS business, which for most founders, if you haven't been, you know, diluted to hell, mm -hmm. um, it's going to be a meaningful amount of money, you know, a life changing amount of money. Um, but then they get snookered because they're like, well, listen, I paid 20 million evaluation for my last investment round. So I'm going to block you for making this, you know, this sale or taking this acquisition off. Right. And, and like a big part of what we're trying to do with Tiny Seed is sort of align investor and founder interest to the point where like, okay, even sub $100 million exits can be meaningful for everybody. Um, that's very much what we're trying to do. Mm. So you don't, you kind of give them a little bit more control in their, their decision making, you know, not just thinking of short term, which a lot of people may look at, like, let's raise capital and just look at short term, but you know, long term, what the implications could be, right? And yeah, I mean, I think like, I mean, if you, it's, it's funny, we actually did a study on, um, uh, in, in order to prepare for our fundraising fund too, we were curious about like, uh, what percentage of, um, you know, how big an asset class is this set of companies, sort of B2B SaaS companies that, you know, maybe bootstrap, maybe took a little bit of money, maybe took one round, uh, but then got the profitable and just drew on their own revenues. Like how many are there of those? Because I think, because my hunch was that, okay, so the mainstream press, you know, means, you know, uh, TechCrunch, Recode, all those guys, they usually report on like the high drama, high stakes, you know, uh, unicorn type companies or what's going on with them. And so we actually studied, we looked at um, about 3000 acquisitions, software acquisitions that were made in 2017, 2019, mm -hmm. and then looked at like of those companies, uh, what percentage of um, actual acquisitions that were announced uh, had any kind of mainstream uh, tech coverage. And um, about 93% of those acquisitions never got mentioned in the mainstream tech uh, market. And then we looked at like, okay, how many, um, and this is a study we're not quite done with, but we started looking at how, of, of the acquisitions, how many had traditional venture capital financing. <clears throat> and the preliminary results show that only about a third did. So the other two thirds either bootstrapped or took a little bit of money or, you know, did something that it's almost impossible to figure out what they did. <laughs> um, so it's a it's a pretty significant um, it's a pretty significant asset class. I think. Yeah, and I think most people just aren't aware that that's an. I mean, they're just here. You know what the typical startup uh, you know route is, and they probably follow that. But you know, there's another path that. Yeah, I'm just going along. I mean, like I'm I'm um, sort of friend, at least I know uh, Sam Altman, who's the president now. I guess he was the CEO. I don't know. He's maybe he's the chairman now. I can't figure it out. And he was saying in January, like how to invest in startups. And <laughs> one of the things he said, which I fundamentally disagree with is like, you should never invest in anything that couldn't become $10 billion. <laughs> now, if, if that, that just can't possibly be true. Or, or if it is, it's, it's a really uh, sad state of affairs for investment into every other company. Because like, it is not long ago that the advice was you should not invest in anything other than something that become a unicorn. So $1 billion. So now it's $10 billion. So what's the next? Is it going to be a hundred billion dollars? Like you have to have a trillion dollar company. There's like four companies that are inv worth investing in the whole world every that's year. Right. Yeah. You got to be Elon Doesn't Musk make any or sense Zuckerberg. Or like, <laughs> yeah. And like, and it's, I think in part it's because of, you know, there are certain dominant ways to think about investing and certain dominant approaches. Typically, you know, there are the safes uh, that, that YC, which I went through and, and, and love, but they came up with and it fits their model, but that's not the only model to do. Uh, early stage venture investments. And I actually think uh, what we're trying to prove is that you could do a much wider set of, um, you know, you can you can back a much wider set of companies and actually that set of companies is probably a much bigger asset class than the traditional venture capital is. Makes sense. And uh, what do you, what is your guys' current investment criteria? What do you guys look for like in a, in a, in a winning startup? Because I know you guys added, you said the 12, you know, new cohort today, which I think was announced. Uh, you know, what was the winning f uh, formula there? We basically like, we almost exclusively or exclusively so far invest in B2B SaaS companies. So that's what we, we like in part because they have some pretty interesting uh, uh, sort of economic attributes. Once they get to a certain stage, they typically, like, <laughs> my friends are in more traditional private equity, call me a liar when I tell them that like, oh yeah, these have like 80, 90% gross margins and you know, 20, 30, 40, 50% free cash flow after that is a certain size. Um, and so we, we mostly care about, and, and they're typically not winner take all, uh, like in B2, B2C. And so 
Well, we think, and we think there can be an awful lot of them. Like people talk about, you know, automation and all this stuff. And I think people, when they hear the word automation, they always think about robots, but like, I think most of the quote unquote automation will actually be software um, that gets built in and around these various industries to make things more efficient. So we think there's a huge number of possible B2B SaaS businesses that are investable. And so we, we, we pretty much invest very broadly across that industry. Um, you know, we, you know, obviously we do the same stuff. We look at the team, we look at the market and we're not going to invest in something that's, you know, taps out at, you know, potentially for a, with a hundred thousand MRR. Uh, but then again, like we, we look at a, a, at a much higher number of like a much wider spectrum of potential uh, software businesses than most, I would say most early stage venture capital does. Yeah. I've seen your, your portfolio seems kind of very well diverse. Um, and so, you know, B2B SaaS companies, uh, you know, I think you, you guys want a little bit of traction. I think you said, you know, somewhere from 500 up to, you know, a couple of thousand dollars in revenue. Um, yeah, we typically don't, we have done one or two, but we typically don't fund people who are pre-revenue okay. or pre-product. Um, just because like there's, well, it sort of de-risks it to a large degree. Sure. Yeah. Um, and also, um, yeah, we, we think, we think that's where our sweet spot is. And we think there's an awful lot of people who are like, consultants or they have a full-time job and then they start a side project because they see a real need in an industry they know something special about mm -hmm. and those are the kind of things that 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 we tend to like um, and what, what are some suggestions you make to some of those early stage maybe they have let's call it, you know 500 mrr um you say you know go back and you know make some changes or start gaining some initial traction before you you say come back and we'll, we'll take a look at you again to get you know We'd, then we'd yeah, we've done that. Yeah. Certainly we've done that. Like people applied in the first round and we were like, eh, just a little early. We'd like to see a little bit more traction and then come back. And in some cases we, we let them into batch two. Mm. Is it just based off the revenue or is there usually something else that you look at that? We look at, I mean, we look at revenue, we look at growth, you know, we, like I said, we look at the team mm. um, and it's like to a degree, it's sort of pattern matching on, on sort of what we've seen in our community do well, you know, the, the in and around microconf, there's an awful lot of people who've done pretty well. Uh, and so and we see that and then uh, my work with discretion also gives me an insight into, you know, the sort of thing that tends to work. Nice. Uh, and then throughout your accelerator, accelerator program, once they're accepted, what are some, you know, underrated resources that you share with the, the startups that they can leverage and start using for their business? Well, I mean, it's, it's hard to replicate, but we have a, a pretty large roster of high quality mentors that we let them access. Um, and, you know, there's sort of like we're working on it right now. We're working on this sort of playbook. What we found in batch one is that most, like if you look at all the skill sets that all the founders have in a given batch, they usually know everything, at least on a one-on-one -on -one level, whether that's pricing or SEO or HR or whatever, yeah. or sales or whatever. But there's usually like holes in, in everyone's, like somebody might know a lot about SEO, but not a lot about pricing, or they might know a lot about enterprise sales, but not a lot about, you know, whatever else. Um, so, so we're basically putting together some of the stuff because I mean, there's sort of a basic playbook that people should be aware of. Like there's certain things that are like, like, so, so a good example is pricing. It's like, if you're like, understand what you're doing, like, are you a high touch enterprise sales business or are you a self-serve, you know, trial with a free credit card or a free trial with a credit card type, uh, yeah. business? Cause it's very hard to, to sort of work across those. Yeah. Like if you have a. $49 a month plan, but it takes, you know, a three demos to close it, then you're not going to do well. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and actually I did the math with one of our batch companies, uh, last year. It's like, you know, the three demos, there's one person on the first demo. There's like three people on the three to four, three to five people on the second demo. And there's two people on the third demo. Wow. Each demo is about half an hour or an hour. And I was like, how much do these people get paid a year? And so they told me, and I was like, okay, so that means that this company that before they've even committed to working with you or, or buying from you, they spent more money in salaries for people demoing than you're going to charge them for a whole year. So, <laughs> Which, so you're, that doesn't make any sense, right? Your, your cost per acquisition is higher than your LTV without even spending anything yet. Right. And it's like the amount of money that they're spending on just the salaries for people to sit in the demo is more money than they're going to pay you for a whole year. That tells me you're not charging enough. So it was the pricing or do you think it was the, just the product as it is? I think it's the pricing. I mean, pricing. I, mm -hmm. this particular company, I think doubled their prices three times in the last six months and had zero pushback. So <laughs> there you go. 
Um, and then within your existing, you know, portfolio of companies, you know, we talked about, you know, pattern matching. Somehow you, you see some level, different levels of growth and success and, and you know, growth rates. Can you pinpoint and share what differentiates like the top performing companies from the others? If, if any, is it like, you know, the product, what did you say is the team? Or was it just kind of luck in the market that they, they just picked? I, I, I think it, to a large degree, it's luck. Um, like if you happen to stumble into something that really resonates, I do think that's, you know, super helpful. I, I don't necessarily see a direct correlation between certain kinds of behavior or, or go to market or whatever and success. Okay. I think there's so many moving parts that you sort of have to, you have to be a little lucky in order, in order to really start to grow quickly. Mm, interesting. Um, and what, when and why did you move from serial entrepreneurs? So you've had some couple of, you know, success back to back, which is kind of, you know, you've proven yourself. And then you move to an inv inv advisor investor role with tiny seed and also discretion capital. Um, yeah, what was the kind of thought process or decision making at that point? So you got there, there was there wasn't much of a thought process. No. <laughs> it was like I did this, and then I got pulled into the M and A work uh, just because, like, what happened with the M and A stuff actually was pretty random. So I was bumming around, and then I got a call from a friend of mine who works at a, a sort of a consulting firm out of Chicago, and he's like, "Hey, man, can you go to Florida next week?" I was like, "Why? Why? Why would I go to Florida next week?" And he says, I will pay you like 15 grand for four days worth of work. I was like, okay, fair enough. Yeah. And so I went and so basically did a bunch of initially technical due diligence work for private equity funds buying like middle market e-commerce mm. uh, companies. So they'd have us come in, take a look at like their tech stack, their, you know, their marketing stack, all that stuff to make sure they weren't buying a dud or, or, or fraud, which occasionally we ran across. Um, and so what ended up happening then was, uh, you know, you, you hang out with the same PE guys all the time. These are the PE guys, by the way, who told, called me a liar when I said that uh, gross margins is 80 to 90% on B2B SaaS businesses. But they were like, hey, man, like, we'll pay for deal flow. You know, like, I was like, what, what, is, what does that mean? I don't understand what. He says, yeah, we would buy a company, you know, we'll, we'll give you a cut. I was like, sweet. <laughs> so I did a couple of those. And then um, sort of in and out, I had two sort of main networks in and around microconf the the bootstrap software conference and then the yc alumni network which is now pretty large and so after i did that a couple of times people started reaching out and saying hey i have this offer is this a good offer what do you think and then i'd give them my opinion whether they i thought there was a shit offer or a good offer and then from there people started saying hey we're considering selling will you run the process for us and sort of i was like all right i guess and then one of my pe friends was like oh so you're an investment bank i was like i'm a what now <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he just figured it out. Yeah, yeah. So I he figured it out before I did. So I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, I guess I should uh, posture in that way. So so yeah, that's sort of how I stumbled into that. And then really, what happened was being exposed to that, I saw you know more and more of these the sort of institutional money uh, moving down market in terms of realizing how valuable these SaaS businesses are, mm -hmm. and then you know the valuations going up for businesses you know say north of a couple of million euro. Yeah, and that's. You know that combination was like oh okay and at the same time you know people were sort of assuming they were worthless unless they were unicorns <laughs> right. and so started doing those kind of deals and then that's when i uh you know pinged rob and said hey you know no one's really funding the very early stages of this like you know companies that yeah they may become unicorns who, who knows um but realistically like nobody's funding you know uh, you know, a company that maybe the goal is to sell for a hundred million dollars or fifty million dollars. So that's sort of the I'm sort of there wasn't much of a plan, put it that way. <laughs> it just kind of stumbled upon you, and now and now you're I'm assuming you're enjoying it. And between the two, yeah, it's fun. It's certainly you know it's less work to be an investor than to be a, an entrepreneur. Hundred so. percent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what would you say is the most common reason? So other than you know, let's say revenue, you know, B two B SaaS. Any other reasons why you turn down an offer to invest in a SaaS company or accept them into our your accelerator program? Um, so there's, we had so many applications that we actually turned down an awful lot of companies that we would have liked to invest in. So I, I actually don't know. I think it probably would have, like the, the, the long-term goal is to invest in hundreds of companies a year. Yeah. Um, but, and so even just out of the last batch, I probably would have liked to invest somewhere between 50 and 75 companies. We just don't have the infrastructure and the funding to do that yet. Um, but yeah, there isn't really like a, a red flag that sort of stands out to me. Um, I think I think the one thing that I probably have as a sort of a hang up with a founder is that 
there, there's a certain type of founder who tends to make sort of mountains out of molehills. Like they, they sort of tend to just like, if there's a speed bump, they sort of like have to stop and like really observe the speed bump and like measure the total height of the speed bump. <laughs> Instead of just running through it. <laughs> yeah. Versus like uh, that kind of personality, I think can, is not particularly helpful, particularly early on. Like, I feel like just to pedal to the metal and just let's see how it goes is often is often more beneficial. And so I think that's probably one of my main sort of hangups as it relates specifically to founders. But honestly, the, the, the sort of set of industries we in, uh, invest across is so large that it there isn't really like a personality trait or uh, a kind of industry that we like. You know, if you're doing B2B SaaS in an industry that's big enough and you seem like you understand that industry and you, you have some sort of advantage um, just of some random dude, we're probably going to be interested. So I saw you, so you guys selected, I think it was around 12 or, or so for, for this batch. You would have liked to do, you know, 50 or 75. Can you share some of the, like the numbers or how are you kind of ranking that? Is it, you have yourself like a ranking system and it's like, okay, these are just absolutely phenomenal. And, and these 40 are like, uh, maybe next time or. Yeah, it's, it's, we have a bunch of different ways we look at it. Um, I mean, certainly like, you know, traction is always a thing. Like if you were 2000 MRR, 18 months ago and you're still at 2000 MRR, I'm going to be like, what are you, what do you, what, what, why, you know, what's going on here? Mm. And it could be something reasonably straightforward. Uh, you know, maybe they're working full time for a job and it's just like, mm, we didn't have any time to answer sales calls. <laughs> In which case we might still be interested. Um, but certainly you come to us and says, Hey, you know, we were at 8,000 MRR last month. We're at 14,000 MRR this month. We're going to be like, no, oh, interesting. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we don't, we don't really have a very strong, like effectively the way that we think about our fund to a degree is that it's almost like indexing into that early stage of that market. Like we believe that um, sort of outcomes in this sort of in what we call the independent SaaS market is uh, parallel distributed very similarly to more traditional venture. And we think that, um, you know, investing broadly in a market like that is, is beneficial in terms of fund level outcome. Makes sense. And, and most of these uh, startup founders are they usually typically one founder or two co-founders. Or more? I think it's 50, 50, one and two. One and two? Yeah, yeah. I think uh, yeah, I find that, that sweet spot of like a tech and a, and a biz dev guy seems to be, you know, work really well, but I don't know if you see it differently. Yeah, no, I, I did that. It depends what you're doing. Like if you're doing high touch stuff, I like to see more sales, some some sales experience. Mm. Um, if you're more B2C, not B2C, but like more prosumer than yeah. uh, uh, someone with marketing chops, it's probably more worthwhile. Mm. Um, but then again, like we have some teams that are purely technical and they, they, they do fine. Like it's not strong. What we, what we tend not to do is entirely non-technical founders. Like if there's nobody who can write code, that's usually, then we usually look quite long and hard at that, but we've done that too. Just depends on the, the skill of the founder. Pretty much. Yeah. If you were, you know, hypothetical question, you know, if you were to go back and uh, start as a, an entrepreneur again, or you know, you're in the, you're in the foots of the, these founders. You have $1,000 looking to start an MVP today, you know, new startup. How do you research for you know, the right idea and then how would you best invest that capital? Um, so I'm gonna cheat out of this question. You, sure. should just go to, you should just go to MicroConf and we just released the MicroConf Video Vault and it includes a bunch of tracks. And one of them is like pretty much how to come up with the perfect bootstrap SaaS startup. Okay. And so that's what I would do. Okay. Okay. No, that's perfect. I would just watch those because there's some really phenomenal uh, talks out of there. One of the uh, one of the main ones is uh, I don't remember his Twitter handle now. Um, Jason, good lord, he's the founder of WP Engine. Come back here with me, Jason something. Sorry, Jason, forgot your last name. <laughs> Um, and he basically, he just did an amazing talk, I guess four or five, six years ago about like, you know, how to get, basically how to get a start, how to get to 10,000 MRR with okay. your business, with your B2B SaaS business. And it's like, there's a bunch of videos around, that's one of them. And there's a couple of others around idea validation, pricing and stuff that I think is just almost like, so the one-on-one, maybe one or two version of how to do bootstrap B2B SaaS businesses. Okay. We'll put a, a link to that in our, in our show notes so people can check that out. Um, last question here. This has really been, this has been great. What, what are you most excited about or curious about at the moment, or where do you plan to focus your efforts for, for 2020? 
I'm more, I'm the most excited about when we get a vaccine for COVID-19. So <laughs> my kids can go back to school and I don't have to homeschool them. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's actually yeah. a miracle that they haven't come running into my office while we're recording this. Oh, yeah. um, so that that's probably my main thing. Um, we're also about to start fundraising for fun for our fun too, which uh, it's it's uh, let's call it interesting timing. <laughs> yeah. So um, so that that'll be my main focus, um, you know, going forward. Probably soft launching that in May or maybe June. Cool. And if anybody wants to get a hold of you, how can they uh, get in touch or, or learn more? Yeah, I mean, um, if you if you want to look at Tiny Seed and, and potentially invest in Tiny Seed, then um, check out. Uh, tinyseed.com slash invest if you fill out that form then i'm the one who's probably going to be responding to you uh, personally i rage on twitter at uh, at Einar um and I'm, I'm i have a pretty unique name so i'm, I'm reasonably easy to find if people want to ping me okay awesome thank you so much I know I'll, I'll add that to our show notes so people can get a hold of you it's really good appreciate it Perfect. all right thank you. thank you all for listening in to today's episode don't forget to join us for another episode where we interview top leaders and experts in the business and SaaS industry. If you enjoyed this episode, I ask that you please give us a five-star review on iTunes. That would be really, really appreciated. Otherwise, if you have any feedback, suggestions, or improvements for this podcast, please feel free to send it directly to me on our website at horizoncapital.com. Or you can just tweet me at Akhil Jabbar. Thanks again, and hope to see you guys on the next episode.